I don't know about your house and your neighborhood, but uh, the uh, we, we have had increasing activity in ours as uh, certain individuals. Uh, the uh, you can't exactly class them as the trick or treaters, though. Uh, uh, they, they, I guess really you could, uh, because they promise treats, but what they generally do is uh, uh, have a trick up their sleeve, and, and by that I refer to uh, all the politicians coming by, uh, knocking on your doors. Uh, you know, they're kind of reverse trick-or-treaters. They, they, they promise you the treat, uh, but generally what they have is a trick, uh, and that's usually what people find after they get them elected. You know, they, they get old Honest Joe elected, and boy, he's going to clean up everything, straighten out everything, they get him in there. It's not long before all of a sudden his relatives began to be uh, on the payroll and, and, and some of them get indicted and some of his people get in trouble. And, and, and uh, you, you know, it's a, a kind of a mark of status here in, in, in uh, Louisiana that you, you, you really have not made it until you have at least been under investigation. Uh, I mean, you, you, you know, an indictment helps, but... Uh, uh, you've got to have at least been under investigation, or, or you simply uh, can't say you have really made it as a politician. Uh, every politician who is anybody uh, has to get investigated at least. But uh, we're in a time that uh, the uh, increasingly uh, this builds to a crescendo uh, as we look up and down and, and, and uh, we see all the signs stuck up in people's yards and we... Uh, you, you turn on television and there are all these ads of all these people uh, who are running and boy, they're going to fix this and solve that and, and what you need is, is their solution. And of course, uh, they all provide different solutions, but uh, somehow they're, they're the ones. And uh, you probably had, uh, many of you, I'm sure, have had uh, uh, some come by and knock on your door. In fact, I think I've been uh, one or two of your house, uh, a few of your houses, uh, when somebody came by and was soliciting uh, your vote, and I've had several that have come by my house, so uh, they're out stirring around, and the world is all caught up in this, and it's going to come to somewhat of a climax uh, here in Louisiana, uh, just a couple of days after the feast starts, when we have the uh, uh, our uh, election, at least the first round of it, and then uh, preceding the general election in the fall, but uh, most of our Races will probably come to uh, uh, their head uh, in October. But the world is getting all caught up in that, all excited about that. And people are choosing up sides and taking sides, and they're for this guy, or they're for that one. Uh, and they all have their perspective. And we're not involved in that. You know, our attention, our focus uh, is on God's upcoming festivals, and we're preparing to celebrate the Feast of Trumpets uh, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, we're going to be uh, off uh, wherever in Biloxi or Big Sandy or wherever we may be celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles uh, when the world is, is uh, getting out the vote uh, here, in, uh, uh, here in this area. So what is, the, what, what is the point of that? And uh, uh, the world gets all excited and caught up in these things. And we don't. We're not taking sides. We're not uh, choosing up and trying to get out and, and to do certain things. Uh, we're not caught up uh, in the hope that the world has that somehow we're going to get somebody in and he's going to fix everything. Now, the reason we're not getting caught up in and involved in those things, that we're not uh, divided up and taking sides, we're not, uh, uh, you know, inviting in certain churches have in uh, various uh, uh, candidates to come in and actually speak there before the congregation and kind of, uh, you know, give different ones their chance to uh, uh, to kind of sway the uh, the congregation. We, of course, don't do that. Uh, various ones uh, host and, and sponsor various uh, uh, voter registration drives and get out the vote drive. We're, we're not involved in any of those things. Why not? Why not? Well, the answer to the reason of why not is very much tied in with the festivals that we're going to be observing beginning in the next few days. It all gets back to what do you have your hope in? Upon what is your hope based? 
All of us as human beings need hope. When you take away the hope from someone, when a person totally loses hope, they give up and they have no hope. They don't last very long. You can't live without hope. You see, why we're going to be doing what we're doing and why the world is going to be doing what it's doing really gets back to the fact of what is it that is the basis of your hope. What is the basis of your hope? I would like to examine and focus in upon that subject today, focusing in upon the basis of our hope and how it differs from the hope the world has and the way in which it very directly ties in to these festivals that God tells us that we are to observe. Now, let's understand that ultimately society is a product of its religion. Religion creates and sets the tone for the state of society. Because, you see, religion is the basis of defining for people the nature of their hope. It is the basis of defining the whole mindset of a society and of a culture. We can look around the world at various societies, various cultures that are the product of their religion. They are reflective of the religion that dominates. You see, even in that sense, and if you look at the things that would really constitute the definition of religion, Communism would have to be classed as a religion. Now, it is a religion that has basically failed uh, even in the minds of most of its adherents. In effect, what has happened is people lost faith. You see, they were willing to sacrifice, they were willing to go through all kinds of things because they had faith that ultimately, communism would provide the solution, would provide the answers, and it didn't. And it didn't. It is a religion that failed. Now, Our so the society, if we want to look back and we want to realize the extent to which society is a product of its religion, we could look and say that in terms of the Western world, that the medieval world, medieval Europe, the medieval Catholic world that existed in Europe was a product, ultimately, of the heresies of the first century. The heresies that Peter and James and John and Paul and Jude combated. The heresies of which we read in the New Testament that resulted within a matter of a couple of hundred years of the emergence of a dominant heresy that ultimately linked up with the military political influence of the Roman emperor uh, that led ultimately to an alliance uh, in the fourth century between the bishop at Rome and the emperor at Rome and the particular brand of heresy, and there were many variant heresies, but the particular brand of heresies that was extant at Rome and was extant in the areas controlled and influenced by the bishop at Rome were enforced throughout the empire as the standard brand. And the council at Nicaea that took place in 325 A.D. presided over, not by the bishop at Rome, but presided over by the Roman emperor Constantine, who had not himself even been baptized as a Christian. At the time that he did that, he was uh, not, did not choose to officially become a Christian until he was on his deathbed. That, by the way, is the introduction of sprinkling rather than immersion. 
You may not have realized that, but prior to the time of Constantine, even the Catholic Church practiced immersion. Constantine waited until he was on his deathbed uh, to officially become a Christian. By that time, he was too sick to be taken out and immersed, uh, so they sprinkled him instead. And uh, in honor of uh, uh, him, then uh, that became the accepted practice. Uh, and the other fell into disuse and ultimately was not simply a matter of disuse, but was actually uh, uh, regarded as uh, heretical. Uh, but uh, there's, there's plenty of evidence that uh, prior to that time, that was the standard. One of those little interesting changes that took place. But uh, anyway, there was a brand of heresy that came to be identified with what was viewed as standard Christianity. Now, this set the stage for a world that was a union of church and state. A world that had a particular worldview. It resulted in the state of things in Catholic medieval Europe. That was, the, that was the society that was produced, that was engendered. Now, every society that man has built has eventually failed. No society, no culture, no civilization that man has built or is capable of building will endure forever. It does not have the basis of permanence. The world that was built, the world that was built, didn't last. The modern Western world in which we now live is in many ways a product of 16th century heresies, also known as the Protestant Reformation, were simply new heresies, a new brand. They produce different results. We live in a world that has become increasingly permissive. We live in a world that uh, our Western world, and Protestantism in particular, has deified democracy. As though that is the, that is what is going to produce utopia on earth. Ultimately, of course, we find our Western world and the modern world engendered by uh, the controlling thoughts of the Western world, our modern world is at the point of collapsing into anarchy, uh, into increasing splintering divisiveness. Is our, our modern world is becoming increasingly splintered and divisive. We see it. All around us, we see it in our nation, and if you watch the news and you look at the news, you find out that what's happening is not, uh, is not confined to this country. There are linguistic and ethnic and religious and racial divisions extant all over the earth. You see, there is a continual splintering and splitting. Have you ever seen a crack appear and it begins to, and the crack begins to run and it begins to shatter? I think most of us have seen that occur and how, uh, how a shattering effect begins to, uh, to occur, particularly, uh, in glass. Then, and it, it, it will, the, the shattering effect will, will spread and a crack will run as it's called. All of a sudden it will begin to, to, to crack and to shatter. And once that has occurred, then the qualities that were there are no longer there. It's no longer something useful and viable. One of the aspects, of course, the Protestant world, you see, neither society, neither culture uh, started from the right focus. The... By placing all the emphasis on the individual, 
then what you have is a continual, the result is, of course, if you take it to its logical conclusion, uh, a, a continual splintering, a continual uh, splitting and divisive aspect, uh, a rejection of the basis for authority, has produced the Western world. And our world, our society, our Western civilization that has been built is at the point of collapse. The Skepticism and the attitudes that were engendered and the anti-authority attitude that was at the basis of much of the, uh, much of the, uh, Protestant Reformation has of course led into the rejection of religious and moral authority. Uh, science, of course, uh, has become one of the predominant Saviors are viewed as the great savior of our uh, modern age. And yet, what, what has happened? You see, we find that there is more involved than sometimes what we thought was involved. In the book of Hosea, chapter 4 and verse 6, the prophet Hosea writes, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you, that you shall be no priest to me. Seeing that you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. As they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore, I will change their glory into shame. My people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge, God says, not a lack of technological knowledge, not a lack of of knowledge in terms of of science and technology. We have great knowledge in those areas, we think, though we have found that much of the things that we thought uh, that we could put our trust and confidence in to deliver us and to save us uh, have, have also begun to prove to be God that have failed. Because ultimately, you get back to attitudes of human nature, to greed, uh, to covetousness, to things that undercut the necessary safeguards to do things properly and appropriately. But the knowledge that leads, the, the lack of knowledge that God talks about is a knowledge of Him. They, the forgetting of God's law. He says, as they were increased, so they sinned against me. The more we have prospered, the more that we have reaped the bounty of God's harvest, the more that we have enjoyed the higher standard of living to which we have moved in the Western world, the further we have moved up in terms of prosperity, the further we have moved away from God and any vestige of the knowledge of God. And many of you who are older that sit here in the congregation, you have seen what I'm talking about in your own lifetime. You've seen it in your own lifetime. As we have increased, as our prosperity has multiplied, so have our sins. Because you see, it's like, well, we got all this, what do we need God for? We're going to find out. Because part of the very things that are prophesied to happen and to occur will do so in the context of showing that the gods of spiritual Egypt are no gods. Ultimately, the gods in which people trust have to be shattered and shown for what they are. Idols. False saviors, false messiahs. The world has a hope that is in reality futile. The world's hope is not going to be realized. Now, right now, people think we're we're standing at the brink, as President Bush said, of a new world order. How right he is. How right he is. But he does not understand from whence that world order will come. Number one, we stand at the verge of a new world order, or what will 
purport to be a new world order, what will eventually arise and sell itself to the world as the new world order to, that is guaranteed to produce peace and prosperity and to guarantee one world in peace and in prosperity. Read Revelation 18. And we read of a system called Babylon the Great. We read of a civilization, we read of a system that is going to be a religious, military, political, economic combine, union. Something that will have worldwide significance. You go through and read in Revelation 18. And it talks about all the merchants of the earth. It talks about the whole world being caught up in something. There is a colossus that is arising in Europe. Even the politicians look and see that the post-war world, the world that was created out of the ashes of World War II, is no more. Some of them are nervous. Some of them are concerned. But they don't know where it's leading. What will arise is going to masquerade as the solution to the problems. You see, things are going to get worse. People are going to be grasping for a solution. As the standard, as the materialistic standards are threatened, here is going to arise what will purport to be what will masquerade as a new world order to guarantee stability and peace. The stage is being set. The stage is being set. Last year, on the Feast of Trumpets, if you remember, those of you who were there, we focused in very specifically on prophecy, we focused in very specifically on the seven times that were to pass over Babylon. We focused in on the time at which the bands were cut and the stump could begin to sprout and grow. And I made comment at that time that last year on the Feast of Trumpets, as we stood there, as we were in assembly before God on his festival day, that exactly seven years, seven literal times, had transpired since the expiration of those seven prophetic times. I don't have to tell you what has happened since the last Feast of Trumpets. I would call to your attention what was said and all of the things that broke loose in the aftermath of that festival. Go back and look up the dates. Go back and look up the dates. Do you realize what has happened in the last year as we come full circle now? As we come full circle, something is emerging. We are going to see an event that many thought would never occur. The official, formal reunification of the German nation that is to take place on the evening of October 3rd as we assemble before God to begin the Feast of Tabernacles. The German nation will be one again. An event many thought would never occur. Brethren, we stand at the threshold of certain things. We stand at the threshold, and and it's not a matter of trying to set some specific date in terms of exactly uh, when and how many days and weeks and months and years it's going to be until every specific thing happens. But he who can look at what is going on in the world around us And think, as Peter said, prophesied that some would, all things continue along as they were, 
You know, where is the promise of his coming? All things continue as they were since the fathers fell asleep. Anyone who can look at the world seen today and think that is blind indeed. Blind indeed. We live in a time where we are seeing the culmination and the beginning of the culmination of many, many events. Many things that go on and transpire. Many things that have been addressed, that have been prophesied. The world has its hope in something that is a vain and futile hope. They're talking about the emergence of a new world order. And they're looking, you know, what's the role that Germany and that Russia are going to play? You remember some of the things we went through last year at the Feast of Trumpets? You remember as we focused in on the two legs, the eastern and the western leg of the Roman Empire, and how they continued down And who were the successors, the just, as the Kaisers of Germany were the successors of the, of the Western Roman emperors? And this, of course, is the section that prophecy focuses upon because it was the only part of the beast ever ridden by the woman of Revelation 17. But that while the Beast, uh, while the western leg of the empire, the succession of governments that occurred in the west is what is focused upon in the succession and Bible prophecy. The successors ultimately, those who claim to be the heirs of Caesar in the west, were of course the Kaiser's The term Kaiser is, of course, simply the German pronunciation of Caesar. In fact, the Latin pronunciation of Caesar is very similar to that. It's more like uh, Kaiser. Uh, those of you who uh, you ever studied Latin, uh, the C is normally pronounced as a K. But uh, uh, the German pronunciation, we, we say Caesar, but the German pronunciation was Kaiser. The... Uh, They reckoned themselves through the succession there as the successors of Caesar in the West. The heirs, the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, as it was called, that was the dominant force throughout the Middle Ages. That was the official title, the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, viewing the Germans as the successors of the Roman Emperor the successors of the emperor in the West. And of course, as I pointed out on the Feast of Trumpets last year, there was another claimant to the title of Caesar. There was another claimant to the title of Caesar. A claimant that traced his claim to the title not back to the Roman emperors in the West, but to the Roman emperors in the East. Because the czars of Russia, who pronounced, who spelled, spelled out in English is C-Z-A-R or T-S-A-R, depending on which, uh, uh, you, which book you read. I mean, it's just, you see, Russians use a different alphabet than, than English, so you have to transliterate letters and trying to approximate the sound. Uh, and so it's sometimes, it's, it's, it's spelled out different ways in English. But the point is, you, you don't have to be, uh, some linguistic scholar to look at C-Z-A-R and figure out that's got a relationship to Caesar. That's what it looks like it ought to be pronounced in, in, uh, uh, in English. Though what they said, the way they said it was more like Tsar. But uh, the point is, they claimed to be, the Tsars of Russia claimed to be the successors of the Roman Emperor, the Roman Empire. They were the heirs of the Roman Empire in the East. Or the Byzantine Empire, as it was also called in later days. 
There were two claimants to the throne of Caesar, two heirs to Caesar, one in the east, one in the west. We see a new world order emerging. That's what the world is calling it. Interestingly enough, that's what the world is calling it. That's the term President Bush used. The Bible talks about something that is ultimately going to be a unification of ten toes involving, you know, unless the image were, was grossly deformed and there's no indication that it is, if you've got two feet and ten toes, you logically assume you've got five toes on each foot. There's no indication that we have a deformed image that's got nine toes on one foot and one on the other, or has got ten toes on one foot and none on the other. The indication is that you've got eastern toes and western toes. You've got an image that comes down, that puts together, that reunites a split that occurred centuries ago. We see that shaping up, but you see, that's not the real New World Order. That is going to purport to be, that's going to claim to be, it says all the world is going to wonder after the beast. In Revelation 17 and Revelation 13, it talks about that, how all the world will wonder after the beast. They will be amazed. And it says that the world will worship the beast. They will venerate. They will stand in awe of this great system that is going to emerge. This system that is going to guarantee universal peace and prosperity. That is going to promise one world. That is going to promise all that people desire. But you see, the pages of our Bible tell us what is going to be the result. In fact, we find this system, which is ridden, pictured in Revelation 17, is being ridden or dominated by this great false church, this great universal church, is going to be taken in a direction that is not currently foreseen by leaders on the world scene, instead of providing and producing universal peace and prosperity, the world is going to be plunged into the depths of what the Bible calls the Great Tribulation. A time of trouble so great that it has never been up until this time, no, nor ever again shall be. ever again shall be. We have that ahead. That's the reality, you see, the world's hope. What holds itself out and purports to be a new world order that's going to produce everything that is good and right is in reality going to collapse. It is going to collapse in the worst time of trouble that there has ever been. There is going to come a disillusionment because you see the ten nations that make it up are not going to stick together. They're not going to have the basis of a permanent alliance. We're told that they are really, it's like trying to make something out of a combination of iron and miry clay. It won't stick together very long. Ultimately, we're told that the ten kings in Revelation 17, we're told the ten kings that have given their power to the beast are going to hate the whore. They're going to hate this great false church. They're going to see that they've been had. They're going to launch the destructive attack that is described in Revelation 18. We are living at a time that is setting the stage for these events. And yet, brethren, do you know that at a time you would think, you would think that at a time when these things are shaping up 
And those of us who have been around the church for a number of years, uh, who have heard about these things and heard it preached, and, and in some cases on the radio going back years and years. And there's some of you that heard Mr. Armstrong on the radio, some of you sitting here uh, that heard Mr. Armstrong on the radio way back in the, in the 1950s, and, and maybe one or two that, that, that heard him in the late 40s. Way back, years and years and years ago. Those of us who have been around for any time, if we've heard these things, and we would have thought that if we could have actually seen these things coming about, that the renewal and revival that would have swept through would be amazing. You know, if we would have seen back in 1965... Or 1967, or 1970, if we had seen going on on the world scene what we see going on on the world scene right now, what would it have done? What would have been the effect? on our lives and our spiritual condition and on the spiritual state of the church. All of us would have certainly thought, and you know, we used to look at the scriptures and the prophecies and Revelation and Revelation chapter 3 and the prophecies of a the final stage in the history of God's church was going to be characterized by a lukewarm, tepid condition. Many of us looked at that and wondered how could that occur when all these things would be happening? How could it be except that people would be more stirred up and more zealous and more on fire than ever before? How could these things occur and people not be stirred up? Brethren, the warnings have been there all along. The warnings have been there. Jesus said in Matthew 24, notice what he told his disciples, what he warned those that were his students. As Mr. Park so aptly pointed out in the sermonette. You see, in most cases, the student chose the teacher. But Jesus told his disciples, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. We have been chosen by the master. To be his disciples. And before he left, before he went back to the Father in heaven, he left some warnings and some admonitions. The question was asked him in Matthew 24, as he departed and came out of the temple, the disciples came unto him privately saying, when shall these things be? We're told in Matthew 24. They got to the Mount of Olives. Jesus had said some incredible things about mass destruction that was going to occur. The disciples came to him privately. They got him off to himself and they said, tell us, when are these things going to be? And how will we know when it's going to happen? See, what will be the signs of your coming, of the end of the age, the consummation of this present world order. You see, what will purport to be the new world order really won't be. It will be simply another in the long line of Satan's counterfeits. Because the world yearns for peace and prosperity. The world yearns for health and happiness. The world has a desire and a yearning. When you look at the suffering and the pain that is going on around this world, Yes, the whole world groans and travails in pain. We look at all of the pain and the suffering. We look at the, the enslavements of, of poverty and ignorance and superstition. We look at the enslavements of all kinds of, of addictive and compulsive behaviors and things that have just absolutely... Warped and distorted people's ability to function in any sort of, with any sort of normalcy. We look at the state of our world, the society that has been produced. 
People can his disciples said, what's going to be the sign of your coming? What? How are we going to know? Tell us, when are these things going to happen? And how will we know when it's almost time? And Jesus warned them. He said, I don't want you to be deceived. Various things are going to happen and going to occur. There will arise many messiahs, many false messiahs, many who claim to be to to be coming as a savior, as a messiah. The world is going to follow many false messiahs. They're going to come many. They're going to use my name. They're going to come many who are going to claim to have the solutions, to have the keys. Many people are going to be deceived. They're going to go chasing after false messiahs all down through history. There have been those who have been the false messiah. There are going to be wars. There are going to be strife. There's going to be increasing, verse 7, ethnic and political division. Ethnic and political division. We're seeing that. There are going to be famines, disease epidemics. These things are just the starting point. This, of course, parallels the seals of Revelation uh, chapter 6. You can go back and go through that. False prophets, wars, famine, uh, disease epidemics. The so-called four horsemen of the apocalypse. In verse 5, or verse 9 rather, he says, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and will kill you, and you are going to be hated of all nations for my name's sake, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another. And shall hate one another. So there was a warning that there would come a time of divisiveness even inside the church. Even among his disciples because he says they will deliver you to be afflicted. You shall be hated. Many will take offense. Verse 10. Shall betray one another. Hate one another. Verse 12. Iniquity will abound and the love of many will wax cold. You see, it is a seesaw effect when iniquity abounds, when lawlessness, when a disregard for the law of God begins to be multiplied, when a careless, casual, lackadaisical, ho-hum approach toward God's law begins to be, to abound, to grow, to multiply, love grows cold. Because ultimately, lawlessness is the epitome of selfishness. A lawless attitude is based on selfishness. I want to do what I want to do, and I don't want to be inconvenienced by having to do something else. You see, it produces a lack of love. He that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. The gospel is going to be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations. Then shall the end come. talks about the abomination that makes desolate. He talks about in verse 22, verse 21, that there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world at this time, known nor ever again shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there would no flesh be saved alive. No flesh would live through it. If the time was not cut short, if God did not intervene, there would not be any survivors. Talks about false Christ, false messiahs, false prophets. Great impressive things that are going to occur. Talks about how the state of the world in verse 37, 38, the state of the world will be in the same state as it was prior to the flood of Noah. We find people going about their normal everyday activities, people pursuing their own life, doing their own thing, oblivious to the fact that judgment is on the horizon. We're told in verse 42 to watch, to be alert, to be aware, not to go to sleep. See, we don't know exactly when he's coming. You know, if he said, I'm going to be here at midnight, you can set your clock for 11.55, have a chance to, you know, kind of get up, maybe 11.50, get up, splash a little cold water in your face, and be all ready. That's not the way it's going to work. We're told to be alert. To be ready. 
And then in verse 46, we're told, blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. Truly, I say unto you, he will make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. What did Christ warn was going to happen? Did he say that the thing that was going to grip the church right before the end was going to be a state of expectant urgency and zeal? He said, told his disciples, he said, what you better be on the alert for, what you better be conscious of, is drifting into this attitude of thinking that somehow my Lord delays his coming. Christ, it, it, that's way off somewhere. That's kind of nebulous and vague and never, never land. And so instead of waiting expectantly, we find getting preoccupied with other things, beginning to smite his fellow servants. It's talking about division and discord. It's talking about those who accuse and gossip monger. It's talking about those who hurt their fellow servants, those who sow discord and division. One of the things that God hates the most Go back to Proverbs 6, and you read the seven things that are abominable in God's sight. And the climax, the culmination of those, is he that sows discord among brethren. God hates that divisive, contentious, accusative spirit. Because that's the spirit that Satan the devil had. That ultimately sowed division among the angels and took a third out. Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. Understand this. You know, who are you to judge another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Scripture tells us that. You see, that's what we have to be conscious of. Ultimately, God knows. God knows. Christ will separate the sheep from the goats. He will separate the wheat from the tares. But he warns about those who begin to smite their fellow servants, who begin to accuse and to attack, and begin to try to maneuver and, and do things that are harmful and hurtful. There will be division. And there are those who have done that. There are those who have gone out and have sought to take away a following after themselves. There are those who have sought to, to stir up division and strife and discord in the body of Christ. God never works that way. You find me one example in all of Scripture where God built anything that way. But he said they're going to begin to smite their fellow servants, begin to eat and drink with the drunken. So there'll be those who get caught up in a worldly lifestyle. Now, you can interpret that two ways. We can be talking about those who spiritually begin to eat and drink with the drunken. The whole world is pictured, you know, as being... Spiritually drunk, spiritually intoxicated. That's the symbolism that's used in Revelation 17. So the whole world is pictured as being on a drunk, a spiritual drunk. So there are those who can be intoxicated with the false attitudes and ideas of the world around this up-and-coming new world order. And certainly it includes also and does not at all that interpretation does not at all exclude uh, those caught up in a worldly lifestyle of physically uh, eating and drinking with the drunken, those who are physically in that state. In other words, uh, getting caught up with all of the uh, the, the worldly preoccupation and out the the, the real uh, party animals. So, what we look, what we're warned about, is. To be on guard against increasing worldliness, increasing preoccupation uh, with blending in with the society around, getting caught up, eating and drinking with the drunken. We're warned to be on guard against increasing worldliness. We're warned to be on guard in our own lives. In our own lives. Too many times what people want to be on guard against is what somebody else is doing. You see, that's what leads to smiting your fellow servant. People want, people want to watch what their neighbor's doing. What Christ tells us to watch is what we're doing. It's generally more fun to watch the neighbors. See, that's human nature. We'd rather look through the neighbor's window and see what they're doing. Huh? Look at them. Huh? Huh? 
you know, what, what Christ tells us we're to watch, we're to keep an eye on, is what we have responsibility for. And we look and we see how somebody else is fudging and compromising and say, boy, you shouldn't do that. Now, we can see that because we're not doing that. Boy, I'm, I'm not compromising there. I'm pretty good, pretty righteous. That's, that's not the kind of watching that Christ is talking about. See, that's the kind that leads into smiting fellow servants. To strife and division and discord and divisiveness. Now, we need to watch our own lives individually, though. We need to take stock of our lives and look back in the last year, in two years, in five years, uh, whatever length of time we've been around and in God's church, to look back to the la- to this feast and the feast before and the feast before, to look back over a period of time, you generally need a little time to get a perspective, and to look at the changes that you've made in your life. Are those changes taking you further away from the world and closer to God and His kingdom, or are you slipping and sliding back into the world that God had called you out of? Are you going backward or forward? So it's not simply change we're after, it's progress. And there's a difference. So he warns of increasing tendency to worldliness, to becoming a part of that. Mr. DeCott's warned about that in the uh, recent Good News editorial, where he talked about, I think, in fact, the title of it was uh, blending, uh, blending in with the world, and he talks about that, exactly what's being addressed, and Verse 49, and then it began to smite fellow servants, this attitude of divisiveness. And you see, what's going to happen is while somebody is bogged down in those things, Christ is going to come and they're not going to be ready. So we're warned. Let's go on. Let's look a little further. You see, Peter warns about, in Second Peter, In chapter 3 and verse 9, well, let, let's, let's notice in verse 3 of chapter 3, Second Peter, he says, Knowing this first, there will come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. They think, oh, it's way off. Where's the promise of his coming? I don't see anything. Verse 8 tells us, don't be ignorant of this one thing. God has a time plan, a day in that time plan. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. So God has a time plan. The week, the weekly cycle, is a type of God's time plan. We're told that the time of the Messiah... And that period is not clearly defined in the Old Testament. You know, we take the term millennium for granted. Millennium is a, uh, simply a Latin word that means a thousand. We, we take for granted the, the, the term millennium and the fact that at the time of the Messiah's rule is a thousand years. You take that for granted, but let me ask you, you go back in the Old Testament, you go back and read through Isaiah and through Micah and through Hosea and through all of the prophets, and you find me a verse that says it's going to last a thousand years. Go back and read Matthew 24 and find me a statement that's going to last a thousand years. You can't find it. If you doubt me, look. You know where you find that it's going to last a thousand years? The book of Revelation. Nowhere prior to the book of Revelation is the length of the Messiah's reign clearly, unequivocally defined as being a thousand years. Nowhere prior to that. Little bit of indication in, in Psalms as a poetic allusion uh, to a thousand years being in your sight as but yesterday. Peter amplifies it a little more. Now, the millennium uh, is characterized, the time of the Messiah is characterized in the book of Isaiah as being like a Sabbath, a time when the whole earth is at rest and they break forth into singing. 
So it is characterized as a Sabbath, and the Jews did understand that, and some perceived the analogy. Peter makes it more plain that a day represents a thousand years, and the time of the Messiah, of course, is pictured as a Sabbath. It is clearly stated and defined in Revelation chapter 20 that that time will be for one thousand years. So it is, the time of the Messiah is a millennial Sabbath. A thousand year Sabbath. The obvious implication made more clear by 1 Peter 3 8 is that it will be preceded by six millennial work days, followed by a millennial Sabbath, the time of the Messiah. God is not flat concerning his promises. He has a time schedule, he has a plan, he has a purpose. God is right on schedule. He may not have operated on the time schedule that some of us had drawn up for him. But God doesn't generally consult us. He doesn't ask us for, you know, the road map that he needs to follow. You know, too many of us sometimes want to be backseat drivers to God. We want God to, you know, in control in our life. We want to turn our life and our will over to God. We want God in control. We want God in the driver's seat. But then we want to sit in the back seat and, make a, and, and, and keep, uh, you know, being a backseat driver. We want to tell him when to speed up and when to slow down and where to turn and, and no, I, you know, let's not go over here and maybe try to wrestle the steering wheel out of his hands a few times because we don't think he's going the right direction. We're afraid he's going to get us lost. He's going to mess us up. So we want to take back over control of our life because we come up, you know, to, to a dangerous spot and we get scared. We're afraid somehow God's going to mess us up. We better get control. And that, of course, is not the way that works. God's not going to operate on our time schedule. He has his own. He's not slack concerning his promises. As some men count slackness. God's not careless. He's not slack. He's not indifferent. He has a plan and a purpose. Now let's look back in the book of James, chapter 5. In verse 7 it says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waits for the precious fruit of the earth. And he has long patience for it until he receives the early and latter rain. Now, let's understand a little bit about that. The farmer waiting for the harvest. The farmer waiting for the harvest. He has to wait patiently. He doesn't just plant the seed one day, go out and harvest the crop the next. It doesn't work that way. And maybe you had had little kids. I remember when, when mine were little, first time they ever planted something. We're gonna, uh, I forget what it was. We, they were gonna plant. They had their little section of the garden. We went out one afternoon. We planted. The next morning, they were out there bright and early. You know, they wanted to see how their plant was doing. Well, needless to say, there wasn't anything to see. It looked just like we left it the day before. And this was kind of perplexing. You know, go out next day and it still looks the same. And the day after that, it still looks the same. He couldn't see any difference. There was nothing coming up. Now, those of you who've had children realize that little children don't really personify patience. Are we there yet, Daddy? Are we there yet? You know, just about the time you're getting out of the, uh, you know, out on the main highway. Uh, you, you haven't hardly gotten on your way to the feast yet. Are we there yet? Are we there? Are we almost there? Well, sometimes God's little children can be that way, too. That's kind of what we say to the Father. Are we there yet, Daddy? Are we there? Are we almost there? Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman has to wait for the precious fruit of the earth. We've got to wait. We've got to endure. Now, it talks about the early and the latter rain. I'd like to comment on that just briefly. Very crucial and important to the harvest in ancient Israel, in ancient Palestine, were the early and latter rain. The early rain occurred after the Feast of Tabernacles. It occurred uh, at the time, the October-November period. Now, this was crucial because this was the time period during which the winter grain crop was sowed. The winter grain crop was sowed after the Feast of Tabernacles. The early rain was crucial because that is what provided the moisture in the earth uh, that would be there, that would enable the seed to germinate, that was was crucial to the to to the beginning development 
Then, in the late spring, after the days of unleavened bread, prior to Pentecost, there was a latter rain. It was the, the late period of rain. That is what brought the first fruits harvest to maturity. That occurred at the beginning of the first fruits harvest period, and it brought the first fruits harvest to maturity. Made it re- and, and gave it that final that final burst that uh, enabled it to 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 grow and to mature prior to the harvest of the first fruits. There is a spiritual analogy that James draws. There needs to be an early, there was to be an early and latter rain. The early rain was identified with the time of seed sowing. The early rain was identified with the time of seed sowing. That is the work of the early New Testament church. The early rain, the early outpouring of God's Holy Spirit was at the time, the early outpouring of God's Holy Spirit was at the time when the seed was first sown. When the church was first founded. That's what laid the groundwork for God's church. There was an early outpouring of God's Spirit that led to the early development of God's church, whose chief work ultimately consisted of providing the New Testament Scriptures and laying the basis for their preservation and use. The church continued through the centuries, in the period that will culminate in the first fruits harvest, in the period just prior to the harvest of the first fruits, there was to be and is to be a latter rain, a latter pouring out of the Spirit to bring that crop to maturity. There is a work of God to be done in our day, providing the way, the warning, and the witness, preparing a people made ready for the coming of the Lord. Preparing a people for the coming of the Lord. Be you also patient, verse 8, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draws nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge stands before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job. You have seen the end of the Lord, the end result, what Jesus Christ did and taught. The Lord is very pitiful. He is of tender mercy. There is a focus here in the latter part of James on drawing close to God, drawing close to God in prayer. Our hope is clearly defined. The the festivals of God are delineated in the context of harvest festivals. We have the aspect, the, the, the emphasis of, of the harvest that is clearly focused in upon. We, we find that in various places. We find it in the book of Exodus. We might just look there briefly. In Exodus chapter 34, Exodus chapter 34, in verse 18, it says, The feast of unleavened bread you shall keep. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread as I commanded you in the time of the month of Ib. For in the month of Ib you came out from Egypt. All that opened the matrix is mine, every firstling among the cattle, whether ox or sheep, which is male. Talks about here the firstborn, the first fruits, 
belonging to God. It says, the Feast of Unleavened Bread you're to keep. Seven days you're to eat it in the time of the month of it. Now, the first month and the name of the first month is emphasized in the Old Testament in a way that the name of other months is not. Other months had names, but the name of the first month had a particular significance. Because the meaning of the term abib or aviv in Hebrew was green ears, fresh shoots, new growth. It was the month of new beginnings. It was the month of new growth. That was the beginning of God's plan and it focused in on part of the harvest cycle. It was the month, the first time that we were to celebrate was the time of fresh growth, the time of new beginnings. Then in verse 22, we were to observe the Feast of Weeks. Seven weeks were to be counted. The day after the seventh week was observed as the Feast of Weeks. Verse 22, of the first fruits of wheat harvest. So the Feast of Weeks was called the first, the Feast of First Fruits. The First Fruits Harvest. We have the first festival characterized by new beginnings, fresh growth. We have the second festival characterized as a time of the harvest of first fruits. Celebrating, we first celebrate the beginning of new growth. We celebrate the beginnings the Passover and unleavened bread season. The second aspect of God's spiritual harvest is the harvest of first fruits. That represents the calling of God's church. Then, we're told in the latter part of verse 22, and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Three times in the year shall all your males appear before the eternal God, the God of Israel. The feast of ingathering, otherwise called the feast of tabernacles. Here the harvest nature is emphasized. Because God's plan is a plan that encompasses the reaping of a spiritual harvest. The time of ingathering. The great gathering in, the great fall harvest, the festival that celebrates the great gathering in. Ultimately, all nations and all peoples are to be gathered in to the government of God. And all nations shall say, let us go up to the mountain of the God of Jacob, to the mountain of the house of Israel. And the God of Jacob will teach us of his ways and the law will go forth out of Jerusalem. We read of that in Isaiah and in Micah. The time that we are looking forward to, the culmination of our hope. A time when the world really will beat its swords into plowshares and its spears into pruning hooks. When they won't lift up sword against nation anymore. Neither will they learn war anymore. A time when the ox will eat straw, or when the lion will eat straw like an ox. When the lion and the lamb will lie down together, a little child shall lead them. A time of universal peace and prosperity. A time that Amos tells us that the, that the thresher will overtake the, the, uh, uh, the sower. That the, the time when, when, it, when it is going to be, or the, 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 a time when the, the reaping will, will last, when, when the harvest will be so great. A time of prosperity, a time of, of abundance. A time when every man will sit under his own vine and under his own fig tree, and none will make him afraid. None will make him afraid. It says, you know, in Amos, that the plowman will overtake the reap. It's going to take so long to reap the crops that they're going to be waiting for you to get out of the field so they can come in behind and, and, and sow the next, because it's going to be such a giant bumper crop. A time of peace, a time of prosperity. A time of abundance. A time when the hopes of the world will be realized. A time when there really will be a new world order, not put together in Europe, not arising out of Rome or Berlin or Moscow, not rising out of the United Nations on the banks of the Hudson River in New York, not arising out of Babylon the Great, not that new world order, because that new world order is not going to last. It won't endure. The mountain of God is going to smash the beast on the image on its toes. It will be smashed to dust. 
will blow away and the great mountain of God will fill the earth. The government of God will be established and will endure forever. We have a hope that is real, a hope that is based on the reality of the promises of God. We stand at the threshold of the celebration of the step-by-step aspects of the fulfillment of that hope. We're going to focus in upon and on each one of the fall festivals. And brethren, as we stand at the threshold of celebrating these festivals of God this year, we need to be stirred up individually and collectively, realizing that we really do stand at the threshold. The judge really is at the door. We stand on the threshold of the fulfillment of all of these things that we have looked for and anticipated for all these years. Don't grudge one against another, brethren. Behold, the judge stands at the door. Christ gives warnings. Warnings to his church, warnings to his people. As we find ourselves standing at this time, an exciting time and yet a very sobering time, we need to take heed to ourselves. We need to draw close to God and to realize that he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved.